I yes. nominate Liz. Oh, sure. So thank you so much. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Oh, John, thank you so much. Are there any other nominations for chair? Going once. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of Liz Sharp to the chair say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. That was the a Any John. nays? <laughs> none. Correct, sir. Correct, yeah. Okay, uh, appointing a vice chair action likely. Is there a nomination? I nominate. Yes? I nominate Dorinda. Okay. So you have a select board member to JP, right? Okay, so and Chris McVeigh seconds. Dorinda Crowell, are there any other nominations for this? Peter Hood, do you have another nomination? No. Oh, okay. I second. Okay, so. Um, Hearing no other nominations, all those in favor of Dorinda as vice chair, say aye. Aye. Yay, Dorinda, congratulations. I look forward to working with you. I'll be sure to be absent at the next meeting. So you Thanks. Can share. <laughs> um, review the 2020 um, Middlesex Here's our other JP, by the way. Board of Civil Authority Appeals Procedure, which is this right here that was approved on July 28, 2020. Do all you folks have that if you want it? Okay, so um, review, do we need to approve it again? Yeah. No, but I just said something that you, if you, you can amend this if you want to. I think okay. you, you voted by majority vote, to if you, or two-thirds, I forget, it's in okay. there somewhere. So essentially when we go through this, just so you guys know, I follow it to the letter. So that it just stays organized and I know what I'm doing because we very, we don't do these meetings very often. So this is a very helpful thing to have that to just follow along so that the meeting is, is orderly. Um, okay, is, is everyone okay with reviewing and feeling like these are good rules and procedures? I just want to change yep. something. The, and the headline, the, the title of this is all wrong. It's from VLCT. It says property tax assessment appeal. It's not. It's property tax assessment appeal. It's just a property assessment appeal. So. Property assessment yeah. appeal. Property assessment appeal? Yeah. Okay. Um, All righty. Appeals hearing of the current use valuation of 267 Portal Road. The chair opens the hearing and welcomes the guests. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> and Today we have appellants John and Kate McCann. We have John here, okay. is that right? Yes. Okay. And their representatives? Yeah, I'm Nick Lowe. Okay, Nick Lowe. Yep. Um, and we have present members, so all of the members of the Board of Civil Authority, just raise your hand that, so we know you're a member, okay? So we are all going to, together, um, take the following oath, and that is on number, that is letter B on the flip page. That begins with under the pains of penalty of jury. So ready? Oh, I think they do. No, it's oh. done in listers. Oh, okay. So just the listers. All right. So listers and appellant. Yeah. yeah. Ready? Go. Under the pains oh. of penalties. Of, you have to say this aloud. Oh, okay. <laughs> under the pains, under the pains and of penalties, penalties of perjury. Of perjury. Do you, Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you have given in the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth, truth and nothing, nothing but the truth? truth. Yes. 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 Great. Good job, everybody. <laughs> I'm not sure that you actually had to say the oath out loud, but I'm glad you all did. <laughs> okay, so ask the appellant if he or she has received a copy of these rules and procedures. Yes. And whether he or she has any questions about how the hearing will proceed. No questions. Okay, great. Um, request BCA members to disclose any conflicts of interest or and or ex parte communication. Has anyone talked about this outside or we've already had um, Theo recuse himself. Is there anyone else that feels they need to recuse themselves? Or, I think yes. I need to recuse myself because okay. I was overhearing a lot of the, the discussion. Okay, so Sarah is going to recuse herself as a board um, of civil authority member already. But are you still taking notes for us, Sarah? Oh, yeah. Okay, just making sure. All right. Um, ask the listers to introduce the property on appeal by describing the property and its present valuation. That would be the listers, not us. Okay, right. Ask the listers. <laughs> yes, yeah, so tell us about this. Okay, the property that is in question, I think, is the property that Mr. McCain just purchased that is right now a vineyard. Mm -hmm. 
And um, we've got some documentation that we'd like to share so that we can uh, okay. all know what we're talking about. And that will be the minutes that we uh, roll after we met with Mr. McCain and Mr. Lowe. So and I'll just stop. I'm gonna, well, so do you, you're going to submit the minutes as, as an exhibit? Yep. Okay. I will, this is be exhibit one, exhibit A. Okay. Mm -hmm. Q, and you're going to, do you need a copy of this? Yes. Okay. And then if you could just pass these to the BCA, pass it down. This is exhibit mark is exhibit A. And how much for the appellants? Everyone, and how much for the appellants as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. Of course. Okay. Should be enough. Okay. So is this, um, Has anyone, has everyone had a chance to read through this? Yes. Okay. And I think we can ask questions of the listeners about this? Sure. Um, we do have two more exhibits. Oh, you have two more so exhibits. Kind of, okay. It goes with All right, the and then, all right. Okay. So this is, we've got exhibit A, the next one will be exhibit B. And what we're sending is, this is the actual cost sheet where we assess the value of the property. And if you read the minutes, it'll kind of go with this on how we assess the property. But if you have questions, we can ask. So thank you. Thank 
Okay, has everyone had a chance to look through this stuff? All right, so are there questions for the listers? So I think the listers get to make a presentation. Oh, are you going to make a presentation? You're going to explain all of this. Okay, okay great. All right. explain all of this. Okay, um, we have guidelines, which was on the last page of the minutes, and that's from the state of Vermont for the LB314 guidelines to the current department. And that's the guidelines that we follow. Um, when we're assessing the property, if a property is subdivided, we go with the property that's being subdivided fun from as far as what the, the codes are, like the neighborhood code and the grade of the property. Um, we also do a drive-by to look at the property to make sure that, you know, it's not a swamp land or something that's different than it's being sold from. Uh, we enter that into our current use calculator and we then in, in, and put it into the Vermont Pi system, which is the, uh, the Vermont state system that calculates how much the current use is going to be. And because we haven't had a townwide reappraisal in six years, the CLA is, um, is lower than it would normally be. We've got one coming up in a couple of years. And so what happens is you take the, the value, which the value that we came up with was actually less than what it was purchased at. And then that's divided by the the common level of appraisal from the state, and that's what it comes up with fair market value according to the state. Now, just to make sure that we're being fair, I also went to the current use department, and, and, I, and I challenged it and asked the question, and they said it's very rare that what somebody pays for property will be what the fair market value is according to the current use department. Um, when we sat with Mr. Lowe and Mr. McCain, the only thing that I could see that we could have done different is when we're, any property that we do as listers, we have to have a buildable site. And if we're not sure where on that land a site is gonna be built on, um, we calculate it as total acres, and that just says, okay, somewhere in that 13.7 acres, there's a possible buildable site on that 13.7 acres. Um, that's our requirement to do, unless you can show us that it's never gonna be built upon. And they had supplied us with a, um, a sales agreement, but because it's not recorded with the town as a legal document, like on a deed uh, through Vermont Land Trust, we can't, because that could be broken from either party. So if we had that, we could have did it as like back land. But because we don't have that, we have to keep that total buildable site included in there, which does make a difference in cost. <coughs> Other questions for the listers? I think we yes, hear John. from the appellant first. Oh, well, can, we, we can't ask. I can wait. Yeah. According to just the, proce the process that you have outlined here, they, so they're get, just, they get okay, to make right, their okay. case and Thanks. then yeah. it's open to questions. Okay. So, um, letter H is where we go. Or H. We are now on uh, yes. F. So you can present your valuation and supporting evidence, please. Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I know this uh, appeal is a little bit out of the usual timing and process, so appreciate everyone taking time out of your day and your evening to come out and hear the appeal. 
Um, my name is Nick Lowe. I'm representing John. Um, I'm with a law firm here in Montpelier. Uh, a little background. John and North Branch Vineyards have had a vineyard on the property since, well, I guess 2018 you've had plant, planting plant, on the property. Planted 2018. We started leasing it in 2017. So up until last year, the vineyard was through a long-term lease on the property. They were finally able to buy the property last year. Um, the purchase was delayed somewhat because there was some dispute with the seller over the price. Um, John had the understanding that the property was to be bought at a reduced rate because it was agricultural use. The seller wanted the full fair market value. After And that's when I unfortunately got involved. When the sale finally did go through, uh, the seller got his way. John did end up paying the full fair market value of one sixteen five hundred, um, and I do have. Uh, I don't know if we need this, but just for the record, I do have the property transfer tax. Um, this is a draft version of this, but it's the one. It's the same one that was filed, and so. Just for the record, to show that that was the price was one sixteen five hundred. Um, Do you want me to distribute this? Sure. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna make one of Thank you. I'm sorry. Maybe you guys can share. Yeah, we'll share. Um, so then, in January of this year, uh, John got a notice from the state tax department saying that the sale had triggered a land use change tax which was associated with the current use program. And the tax is 10% of the fair market value. And that's where this town appraisal comes in. Uh, you know, the, the number that we land on with the town appraisal, uh, it's a 10% tax to John. So if it's 147, that's a $14,700 tax to the state. If it's one sixteen five hundred, it's eleven thousand six fifty. So, pretty you know, pretty significant difference in tax that John would end up owing to the state. Um, you'll see on this this LV form that's the state tax form, where basically, as the listers were saying, um, they basically put in the this number of 106, 100 that they came up with. And then the state uh, divides that by the common level of appraisal, which is 0 0.7172. And then it, based off that, it calculates this fair market value of 147,936. Um, I have another exhibit here. And I, I'm sorry, I only have four copies of this, but um, this is from the Vermont Legislative Joint Fiscal Office. Actually, we can give you five copies. Yeah, you can take mine. Um, Here. And it basically, you know, it's basically explaining what the, comp, what the purpose of the common level of appraisal is. And this will say it better than I can say it, but from, you know, how I understand it, the idea is that towns don't appraise property every year. Some of these appraisals get out of date. And so the state uses this common level of appraisal to balance those out and try to bring it up to the actual current fair market value. But, you know, if you go back to this form, you know, it's adjusting the 106 to 147 using the common level of appraisal. And again, the idea ultimately is it's trying to get to the actual fair market value. Um, which is kind of, you know, what we're here today to figure out what is the actual fair market value. Mm -hmm. um, there's only one of those. It's not like there's a different fair market value for the state and a, and a different one for the town, you know. Fair market value is fair market value. Uh, and our, you know, the, the courts have often used as figuring out the fair market value, they'll look at, well, what did, what did the property sell for? You know, that's, that's your best benchmark. You know, what does someone actually pay for the property? 
in this case, the actual payment on the property was one sixteen five hundred, um, and so you know we think this form should be adjusted so that the fair market value is one sixteen five hundred, which would mean instead of one oh six one hundred, putting into there eighty three thousand five fifty three. And then going through that calculation, you come up with the fair market value of 116500 which again, it's the price that was actually paid. It was negotiated. It was pretty hotly negotiated. That was, the, that was what the seller, you know, wanted to get on the, on the market. And so, you know, kind of a simple argument, I think, on our part that whatever the, however the calculation works out at the end of the day, you know, you're trying to get to that number and we know what the number is, and it's 116500 I don't think it'll make a huge difference to the town in terms of their tax revenue, especially because the, the property is being re-enlisted in current use anyway. But it will make a, a huge difference for John in terms of uh, the penalty that he'll end up having to pay to the current use program. Um, I guess, you know, another thing that the listers mentioned is that the property is going to go there's going to be a permanent conservation easement with Vermont Land Trust. There's an agreement with the Land Trust to do that. There, it was supposed to have happened back in November. The Land Trust has pushed that out. Now it's supposed to happen at the end of April. Um, but with that agreement in place, you know, John's locked into that. The property's not actually going to be developed. There's no, there won't be any home built on it or anything. Um, and I guess lastly, you know, it's it's built out now as a vineyard. There's grapevines planted on it, and there's a a few thousand feet of PVC drainage tiles in that as as part of that agricultural use. If someone were to come in and want to build a house, you'd end up having to dig that out and redo a lot of drainage, which I think would add, add a lot of site work and effectively, you know, increase the cost of development and kind of decrease the value of the property as a developable lot. Any, anything else, John? Um, during the time when uh, we were getting ready to do the subdivision with um, Randy Jocelyn, um, part of the state's uh, requirement was that Randy had to prove on his property that would be continued to be in his ownership that the site would have to be able to have a new septic system installed um, and the reason they do that is they want to make sure there's enough land accessible to have a new septic system in before they would go ahead and finalize the subdivision so we did hire a um, civil engineer to come out and do a site where I actually dug the hole for him um, on, on Randy's um, current home site. And what we found was that it was not acceptable for a conventional system. Uh, so at this point, uh, that has only been done on the part that Randy still owns, not on our site. So we haven't had any site development in terms of even knowing whether our site is perkable for on-site septic. Um, so we don't, at this point, even know that it would be buildable if we wanted to build on it. Um, that would be something that we'd still have to hire out a civil engineer to come in and confirm. So at this point, it's not a buildable site. Any more evidence you'd like to present? Anything else? Um, I, I also guess want to say that part of the contract between Randy Joslin and myself um, was the fact that in our contract it states that our site has to be conserved. So even though it hasn't been officially conserved with the Vermont Land Trust, it is in documentation that um, we have to conserve it. Uh, it's, of course, not recorded because we haven't conserved it yet. Um, and again, the delay is not on my part. I was hoping this was going to be done last year. 
Um, but they keep finding constraints that keeps pushing them. Um, and I'm constantly uh, in communication with them to find out when that's going to happen. And right now, the earliest is April. And again, with the possibility of slipping again. So we're already well into uh, over a year of, of getting into the part where we conserve it and um, make this agricultural land permanent. Can you say who the they and the them is? So um, they would be Vermont Land Trust. OK, thank you. And also them. Any more evidence for you guys? Because then we'll go to questions. Anything more? Okay. <clears throat> um, or no, we'll ask the listeners to respond. <laughs> I mean, I guess I do have the purchase and sale agreement with the Vermont Land Trust. We might as well, because it's been discussed, we can just put that in. And okay. folks are not going to want to read this right now. It's pretty long and boring. But also, we have a time constraint on these yeah, things. They right. last on no more than 30 minutes. But we can just put that in just for the sake of having it. OK, so at the listers, you can respond to the information presented. Well, I've got a, just the question. I mean, it, it, it appears that he's going to leave it in agriculture land. And I know that current use is very strict. We will have to have like a 25 acre minimum for forest land. And I'm not sure if agriculture, you need that. Is there any chance of working with current use so that you wouldn't get a penalty at all by putting it back in current use? Well, it's been, it's, it was previously enrolled as ag in current use. And you, the 25 acre minimum doesn't apply for agriculture. And it's being it basically just when the land, when the deed was conveyed, the current use program kicked it out and then it goes back in. And so, and that's what triggers the penalty. And so it's nothing actually changed. You know, the, the land is still being, it's ag use, it's still being farmed, but it bounced out and comes back in under the new deeded owner. But has anybody talked to current use to see if that can be waived because of that? We're. We're working on that separately. First of yeah. all, um, yeah. so as soon as as soon as I purchased the land, there was a letter sent to me from current use that says you have 30 days to reapply into current use. I reapplied within those 30 days. So um, I, I believe I was in here, and I may have spoke to one of you two oh, six months, maybe a little, right before I came in to find out what taxes I need to owe on this property. And you somebody, and I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was, but said, we haven't figured that out yet because of the current use issue that's going on with it. Um, and the fact that I had re-enrolled, and I even paid the fee to re-enroll, um, and that's in limbo right now because of it being kicked out like this. So we're still trying to figure out where that is. But it's eligible to go. It is eligible. And we're so, trying to get the, the penalty waived, but as of, it's, it's the state and it's going to take a while. As of, as of law, uh, because it's 25 acres or less, um, and I am an agricultural farmer, the land just needs to, to be able to uh, generate more than $2,000 worth of revenue off from the agricultural product, which we have met, and actually, um, over a year ago, when Randy Joslin did subdivide this property, um, he actually asked me to submit to the state my financial records to prove that we did generate more than $2,000 revenue. So he was able to re-enroll it under current use after he subdivided the 13.7 acres. OK. Um, Sir, how's our time? We're getting near. Yeah, we're, it's getting pretty tight. Okay, so are there questions from the BCA members about this? I have some. Yeah, Chris. Um, this exhibit C, this form there, um, who fills in the numbers for this? Like, who, you, who puts in the CLA? The CLA is us. It's a, it's a firm thing that's distributed from the state to the town. Because that's the first year. It changes yeah. every year, depending okay. on our grand list. And does the CLA apply to every everybody? Yep. Yeah. There's no variation, no deviation no, right. from no, it? No. Okay. 
Uh, and so is this somewhat of a mechanical form that you put in the numbers and the CLA prints out with yes. eight determinants of the fair market value? Yeah, and I, the, this form is actually just a page three of what we got. So I have the full three pages here. Um, but I, so I don't know who, we don't know who filled it out. We just, John received it. Okay. The but it is mechanical. And I, we, we receive as listers from the state. We get it, in the, we get it on the computer. Right. So and, all, all we do is fill in the, the uh, value of the acre. We always fill it in 106, 100. Which is an arbitrary number, I should point out. 106, just, it, it, it has nothing to do with anything with our land, we bought it for 116.5. The yeah, 106 it has is. To do with the grade of the land, the land that it was taken from is almost duplicated, unless that land was in a lot better shape than yours. So the, the grade and everything is taken from the land that was subdivided. So all them values mean something. And I think the, the listers that, you know, we understood from speaking with them when we, we appealed to them before we came here mm -hmm. is that. When they come up with this 106 number, they're constrained by basically they're used. They're working with a computer model, and they can put in certain certain parameters, and then it spits out a number. And I think the board here has more flexibility to take kind of a, a broader view. You don't have to kind of mechanically just we, we apply a certain. In, we couldn't put in eighty three thousand dollars for the land value because that would be way less than the land has been valued forever and ever and ever. Well, the and, same land. Re, you know, respective, respectfully, our position is that the, it's still the correct number. Um, 106. Sorry? The 106? They, no. E, no. The 83 no. that to then get to 116. gets to 116. And I think the, the common level of appraisal number does apply to everyone's property equally, but it's assuming that that those everyone else's property was appraised six years ago and isn't up to date so it's pulling everyone's numbers up what we have is 116.5 is the today value of this property already i'd like to recognize peter peter so this is a question for our listeners isn't it isn't it true that we apply the same methodology to valuing this land as we do all the other open land in Middlesex. Yes. Yes. So this is a, this is a standard which we apply town wide to value land. And in my memory, and I could be wrong about this, but in my memory, when we have had people approach us and say, "How come I paid this much for the land and you valued it at this much?" And this is ignoring, ignoring current use rules and all that business. But we pretty much stuck to our guns and said, this is how we value land for all the land in Middlesex. And your land is going to be valued the same way, regardless of the purchase price. I'm not aware, or maybe we have, but I'm not aware that we have ever accepted the purchase price as the market value. Like I said, the current use um, instructor said that purchase value is rarely the same as the current use value. And the other, the other thing to take notice of is depending on how many acres you have, uh, which sounds kind of strange, but it's almost like a dozen eggs. You buy a dozen eggs for five bucks, you buy one egg, it's going to be a dollar. The more acreage you have, the less the land is per acre. So once you cut off like 10 acres, that is a standalone property and is valued as a standalone property, even if it came from 100 acres at 400 an acre, now you're paying maybe six or 800 an acre. That's how the, the whole calculation is in the, in the land, land system. So again, aren't I I'm yep. correct in saying that the formula that we use to derive the land value is a formula that we use across town. It's not a formula that we made up yes. for this particular transaction. Yes, yes. and the, the only thing that would make that different is if you can, without a reasonable doubt, say it could not be built upon. Because it's calculated in there that there's going to be a two-acre two buildable lot. And uh, again, the only legal document we would have if it was part of the deed that land trust had went through. But not having that, we have no way of knowing if that's a buildable lot or not. 
But but you do have that because you do have the purchase and sale contract between the land trust that it's going to happen. Which legally could be broken before the closing date. Can, I've done well, that buying a house before. Just quick clarification. Yes, John. You, yeah, thank you. You bought the property from Mr. Joslin, or he subdivided. How is the land trust involved in the contract for purchase and sale? There's, there's a separate agreement between the McCanns and Joslin requiring the McCanns to enter into the agreement with the VLT. Okay. with the land trust. Okay. And if I could, can, can I just quickly respond to the prior issue? I, I understand that the 106 number comes out of this computer model that the town uses <laughs> town-wide. And that could be, you know, a great model that comes up with an excellent estimate, but it's still an estimate. And I think the actual amount that someone would pay on the market is a better actual number of the fair market value. Um, and, and I would say that the Vermont Supreme Court does often and, and frequently re rely on the actual price paid when it comes to these uh, valuation questions of how much is a property worth for, for tax purposes. Okay, we are really running out of time. I'd like to recognize Randy. Yeah, I just, I, just in response to that, that methodology with using the, the purchase price, you know, if this number came back um, and common level appraisal adjustment was still below the market price that you paid at the point in time, we wouldn't be coming after you to say, you paid more than this and we're going to adjust this number to that. It's, it's not even, I don't even believe that's legal. So I think, you know, um, as Peter said, having a common methodology across the town is necessary and Unfortunately, I don't think it fits your your situation from your purview. But I think for the town, you've got to you've got to establish that standard. Jan. Um, well, I, I must say I have to agree with the listers. I used to be a lister for the town, and this totally is what we've always done. Um, my one question to you, though, is um, when you were in negotiations with uh, land trust usually when you are doing, promising to do what you're doing, you get a good deal on the land. Well, so I'll go back to say that. So um, in 2017, um, we entered into a contract, long-term contract with Eugene Jocelyn, who was the father of Randall Jocelyn, uh, who also was the town clerk here at Middlesex at one point. Um, Unfortunately, um, he passed away, um, wonderful man, um, but we had an opportunity to sit down. He was a dairy farmer here in Middlesex and wanted his property to, to continue in agricultural use and not to be developed. Um, so we entered into this agreement, and on that agreement, it said that the land would be sold to us as unimproved farmland. Uh, now, unfortunately, when Randy became the executor, um, he challenged that verbiage. And at that point, um, and, and, and Nick can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what we, and Randy didn't want it developed in terms of, of anything other than farmland. And we said, okay, well, we'll give you the 26,500, which is what the agricultural appraisal was of the property at that time. Or we'll give you 116,500 and you don't have any say on how the land is being used. He chose to go the 116,500 rather than the 26,500. So we did have a contract that says that it would be sold to us for ag land value. We got into what, ran, what Nick says, a contested argument on that, and we decided to go with the 116.5 just to clear the air. But there's nothing in the deed, correct, I said. that says, because I reviewed the deed, there's nothing that says that you committed to keep it as ag property. Because we did review the deed. It's okay, not we're running out of time. I do want to recognize Randall on the iPhone. 
Uh, this, that, yes. is a, that, is a, that is not a BCA member. Oh, he's not a BCA member. Yeah. I'm sorry, Randall. No. We can't. And probably this exchange should probably stop. Okay. Okay. All right. So we are running out of time. There's next steps that have to happen. Um, we have to uh, in point, appoint an inspection committee. Is that happening? Okay, and point an inspection committee of three BCA members to inspect the property, because no decision is being made tonight anyway, um, to inspect the property at a date and time set by the chair and report its findings back to the BCA. Are there three BCA members who would like to volunteer to physically visit this property? Chris, Jan, and John, okay? Chris, Jan, and John. Assuming we Yeah, Chris, Jan, and John. And so uh, we need to, we want to do this quickly. I don't want this to go on for day, weeks and weeks. You have to do it within 30 days. Right. Yeah. I'd like to do it sooner than that. Is what I'm saying. You just have to pick a time and date. Yeah. So you guys, can you look at your, and know when these guys, do they need to be here or no? The no, owner? I think they're, I think they're. No, uh, actually, to be, what are, who's handing out business cards here? And that, John. Okay, we're not going to have any ex parte communication here. Right. Between the no, just, that's just to set up an appointment. Right? And know where they're just, located, maybe. This is I, just, I really, yeah. you should not be on the property when they come. Yeah. And nor should there be any listers. It should just be the, absolutely. I, it should just be the subcommittee. Yeah, it should be yeah, no listers, okay. no yes. appellants. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely no That's fine. You know, Senator, when we've done it before, the owners have been there. Yeah. 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 No okay. Owners. I've been to someone's house and the owner's okay. there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Been I would just think. They're, they're allowed to, if you can go to somebody's house, they should be there, but they can. You can't have yeah, they're not walking around with no, us. No, 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 okay. right, right. Yeah, no, we know. Um, yeah, we, I know we've had that. I know we've had that issue. We can't have conversations. Um, so there can be no email like, conversations. Right. You can There cannot be even email conversations between each other. I don't even think. You, by the subcommittee. Yeah, by the subcommittee. I don't. I think they can talk. Mm, I don't know. Well, they have to put together a report. Yeah. I know, but I think remember we had to do it in person, Jan. There was something like yeah. that. The three of us, we no, had that. Put, put, put some email. Okay. Oh, you mean not one, one or the other? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what date do you guys want to do this? Um, it's just land, well, well, we'll, right? We'll, we'll it's not. To, you know, can we, we do that? We'll, we'll, I'm we'll not prepared. Prepared. I don't Yeah, know. I know. Okay. I need my calendar. Hey, listen, do you want? Do we have to reconvene then? We, we're going to then recess to a date and time, not more than 30 days from today, to accept the inspection committee report. So, won't we do this? Won't we reconvene to the next? Um, select board meeting. Okay. Uh, which is that two weeks? Two weeks, yeah. So that'll give us a framework from when we have to and get so together. And so within the next two weeks, you will go and you will let us know when that date is so we can You guys can have a report it. done by then? Uh, so? Two okay. weeks is when? What is that date? By April 2nd? Um, it's going to be the 2nd. Of April? April 2nd? Yeah. Okay. okay. That's okay. fine. That's fine. Wow. So between now and April 2nd, they'll come and look at your property. And so what time do you want to meet on April 2nd? Well, just oh, normal, for the BCA like meeting? 6.30. 6.30? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we'll reopen the hearing um, and we'll do the rest of this, right, Sarah? So that, we kind of end this now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah. So we're at number M, which is recessing to a date and time, right. which is April 12th. Sure. Okay. April 2nd. April 2nd. I'm sorry, April 2nd. Yeah, April okay, that's 2nd, an L. 630. Before we recess, do I have a chance to make one comment? Or are we done with that? And I could stop um, until April 2nd. I think, we're, I think we're pretty much done with okay. comments at this point. Um, so, okay, I guess that's it. So, Thank you. Yes, so this, Chris? We know we can hear the comment at some point. From the <laughs> so <laughs> I think we all want to hear it now. No, no, it's fine. You sure? Yeah, okay. I don't okay. want to do anything that seems like it would... No, I just, I don't want to then start having other conversations that might arise from it. Yeah, well, this will do that. Yeah, and I mean, we've already gone over the, the allotted time. So, um, okay, so thank you guys for coming, and thank, thank you. you listeners for coming and presenting your evidence, and we'll see you back here on the 12th. Uh, sorry, I keep saying the 12th, the 2nd of April. I think it's really unusual that, that I've never, I can't believe this is part of our policy that the, that the, the appellant and the listers get to comment on this, on the subcommittee report. I don't remember ever doing that before. Do you guys remember? I, I think yes. Yeah. I think so. The, 
So we had it's a, just a yeah, I, I don't know. We do these things so Thank you guys for coming. So you. I do have a quick question, though. No. Are we going to see the report before coming I, to the meeting? No, they don't see the report before coming, right? It gets no, presented no. after the next They weeren't there yeah, when it gets presented, presented uh, by so these guys. So you guys come. Okay. okay. I, I think it's, I still, I'm going to raise some You're questions find about out. whether or not the listeners and the appellant get to comment on that subcommittee report. My recollection is the subcommittee report is handed to the BCA, the BCA discusses it, and then the BCA makes a decision. Okay, but where did you get this? these instructions? The LCT, but then on the other hand, the LCT is <laughs> calling it a property tax assessment. Okay, so. Anyway, I'll just give you a package. Stay tuned. Okay, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. So All right, so we're now adjourning the, is there a motion to adjourn? No, wait, we still got to do this. Oh. Sorry. I got to do this May 7th, Washington Central. So, hold on. Oh, and that's still a part of the BCA. I'm sorry, so we're done with you guys, yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Happy later. So Thank we're still so doing something on the agenda about the May 7th uh, voting Thank date you. for the school budget. Good luck with the property. Designating... Um, Middlesex Town Hall is the polling location for May 7, 2024. Revote of the fiscal year 25 WCU USD wait, wait, budget with polls open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Action that. likely. Uh, is there anything you want to tell about this, Sarah? Yeah, we're having a revote. They're not going to squash the school district. is not going to be all the ballots, nope. right? right? So okay. we're going to open the, uh, just because the polls have always been warned for the, I just need you guys to approve using the town hall for the yeah. polls. And then I need, I'm sorry guys, to appoint two JPs again to carry those Washington Central yeah. ballots. At so that, that time, I confirmed the ballots are being counted that night. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay. a Tuesday also? May 7th. So let's just Tuesday. first designate Middlesex Town Hall as a polling location. All those in favor? Or yeah. a motion? I'll move, move that we... Uh, okay, second? Town Hall. I'll second, second it. it. Okay. Who, who seconded it? I did. Okay. Dorinda, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then, Aye. and then designating the following to act as election officials for the above vote, Cheryl Granfield, Assistant Clerk and Treasurer, Dorinda Crowell, JP, former Assistant Clerk, Marika Gillis. Yeah. Is there a motion for those three? So moved. Wonderful volunteers. Um, is there a second? Yep. Okay. Who, and was, this, who was the second? Randy. Randy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And now appointing two JPs to deliver voted WCU USD ballots to the East Montpelier Elementary School for tabulation after the polls, polls close on May 7th, 2024. Is there a motion to appoint two people? You want to vote? I, you know, I would do it since I missed out last Okay, time. so. <laughs> I would nominate Chris and Jan. Oh, thank you oh, so God. much. Is there a second? <laughs> I'll second it. Oh, thank you, Durinda. All right, all those thank in favor of appointing these two JPs to deliver votes? Aye. 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 All righty. So, um, okay. any other things before we close out this meeting? <coughs> All right. We're adjourning the meeting at 7.15. Okay. No, Thank we're not. You. We're doing it at 7.23. Four. Wow. <laughs> and, Sarah, that's May 6th at and 7 p.m.